So Gloria is a research professor at Vrij Universiteit Brussels. I hope I get a round of applause for pronouncing that correctly. VUB, <laughs> Faculty of Law and Criminology. She is the co-director of an interdisciplinary research group. Perfect, right? Interdisciplinary is what this is all about. Law, Science, Technology and Society, LSTS. As a legal scholar, Gloria investigates legal issues related to privacy and personal data protection, topics which are obviously all highly relevant to this conference. In Gloria's talk, she will propose requalifying all those participating into the making of the data feeding AI systems and the processing thereof as data makers, thus highlighting their different roles in the creation and recognition of data as data. Please welcome Gloria to the stage. Hello, hello everybody. I'm Gloria gonzalez Fuster. Thank you very much for uh, welcoming me here, for the invitation to be here. It's really, really, really nice to be here. I always love to go to places where the first edition, so you can always say when it becomes mainstream, I was there, the first edition. <laughs> so if it's the first edition, you, you should always go, and I, and I try to go. But it's also uh, a pleasure for me to be here because it, I think it's, it's really a, a, a unique uh, event. This. Um, uh, this, well, this um, combination of anthropologists and technologists, and I have to tell you already, in case you did not imagine this, I'm a bit of the outlier. I am a bit, I'm not an anthropologist, I'm not a technologist, I'm a legal scholar, and I will also be an outlier because I don't really have slides. Actually, I, I was planning not to have slides, and then this morning I was less convinced, and, 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 and then uh, so maybe I would try to make an effort to fit in, so I found this compromise uh, solution. Well, the first part of the talk, we don't have slides, and then we have some slides. <laughs> so that's, um, yes, an outlier try, trying to fit in. I, I'm a legal scholar, and indeed uh, it was mentioned I'm not uh, a standard, standard legal scholar because I am with an interdisciplinary research group. And I have to tell you, it's more complicated than this, actually, um, from an interdisciplinary research group where we all disagree on whether this term interdisciplinary is uh, even acceptable. <laughs> so when, when we, we have this discussion, we say cross-disciplinary, no multidisciplinary, no tri-disciplinary. So in the end, we leave it at interdisciplinary, like, uh, like this. We do try not to touch it, but it, it's very, very complicated. Now, that's my sort of real life, but most of the time, uh, so I work mainly on data protection, privacy, data protection law issues, and, and I go to a variety of conferences with people with uh, a lot of different backgrounds, and, and, and often, indeed, even if we are interdisciplinary, uh, we, we are just uh, the legal scholars in the room. So this, this will be uh, what I will be uh, uh, today. I will be representing the, the legal scholars. And my main, I will try to have, yes, I will talk about this, which is the, the subject of, of the, the talk, the data makers, but I will basically, my main message is to try to convince you that we should all be friends. So not, not personally, <laughs> but uh, as the, the people that I represent, representing legal disciplines, uh, we should be friends with anthropologists, we should be friends with technologists. Indeed, if we want to do something interesting, especially in research, it's, it's nice to, to, to work together. So uh, basically that's, that's it. And I will try to talk about data and these data makers, but really the, the key concept here is uh, this notion of data. And we had had some discussions on intelligence, uh, artificial intelligence, the algorithms, many, many things that are, uh, somebody said in the Petrakucha session, somehow at some point all this relates to data. I know that technically it's not necessarily the case. You can have machine learning that it's not data related. Yes, but in practice, our society is very much uh, connected to data. So the, the talk now is really an invitation to think uh, about this data and how do we make this data? Where do this data come from? What do we do with it? And so there are no slides which is a good thing because then uh, I have to invite you to actually, because you, you have seen many slides, you had this Pecha Kucha thing, just, just, if you can just close your eyes, uh, yes, you can close your eyes, I don't feel offended, just close your eyes and, and think uh, of an image that represents for you data. What is data for you, I think it's, it's, um, it's a difficult one, I don't know, I let you, but we have half an hour so you can think about data and, 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 and eventually at some point later tell me what, did you, what were you thinking, were you thinking about data? For me, it's, it's, it's not that easy when I try to have slides and, and try to represent data, and I think it's very, very important that we uh, make this uh, explicit, that we are probably having different images of what data are, and that these images of what data are and how we think about data, this matters in the way in which we, we analyze all the problems that, that, we, that we have. Uh, 
So, uh, actually, I'm now uh, realizing that I forgot to say something about my, my presentation. Uh, yes, uh, so we have had some discussions about, uh, about data, and I was uh, saying uh, I'm here because I like to make friends, and I, want, I think I have to convince you that we want to make friends, be, be friends, but uh, I also uh, think, as you know, one of the great uh, arguments of politicians especially is that uh, we can become friends and build bridges and have this shared uh, interest in things because we also have a common enemy. I don't know if you have an enemy, uh, then if I, if I tell you who is my enemy, then we, 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 uh, maybe I have less friends. But I think uh, uh, one of the concerns that I have or the questions that I have uh, and that I think some of you have is about the role of ethics in all, all discussions about data. So uh, it's not perhaps my enemy. I, I gave up on the idea of trying to fight against the discourse of, about ethics. Some of my colleagues are really into this. They talk about the ethification of, of everything. Uh, so I have, as legal scholars working on data protection law, this question of all everything being an ethics debate, it's really regular. So we, we are um, amalgamated with, with ethics uh, discussions. We are invited to talk at ethical uh, things. Everything is data, big data ethics, AI ethics, uh, and all this. I gave up. I, it's no longer really my, my enemy. I try to not to, to counter uh, this, the fact that actually many of the things that people call ethics are probably legal ethics, and that's a good thing that they are legal ethics because it means that if somebody does not respect them, they might be sanctioned. I gave up and I changed strategy and I do the Occupy Ethics strategy now. So when I'm invited uh, as an ethics expert because I work on data protection law, I go to the places and I pretend that, yes, I care for about ethics and data ethics, and then I talk about data protection law. So uh, <laughs> what, this is, this is what, what I will do also today. Uh, it's not that I'm, I'm not interested in anthropology and technology, and I would really like to understand also why you could be uh, useful for, for, for us. But I will talk about data protection law because I really think actually that uh, data protection law is also interesting for us to understand better how data are being made, how data are uh, created. So in, in, in this idea that I have about data, data are something that are uh, relational and actually discovered very recently that are, there are some anthropologists somewhere that claim that data should be envisaged as a relation between things. Uh, I think indeed there, there's, a, there's a computational dimension, there's, there's a material dimension, there's a human dimension, data related to somebody, they are somewhere, they're in a special format, there's a legal dimension, there, there's an important, uh, we recognize data as data from a legal perspective in some cases, so we see some data, some data, we don't see this data as data. So data is really also for me an event, it's something that it's somewhere in time but tends to disappear and I think from a material perspective also we, we, we store data somewhere but we have to keep data alive otherwise they, they die, they change, they, they transform. So uh, it's really important that, that we develop an, an, uh, this concept that we have uh, of data. And, and in this concept that I have, uh, this construction of data goes also through the law and, and the interactions that the law allows us to, to, to put in place. So to think about data, we have to think about data protection law. That's lucky for me. And then I will, again, the last time I do this, but I have to ask you to close your eyes and think about data protection law. <laughs> Yes, I don't know what you're thinking, but uh, I can say that statistically most of you uh, get it wrong. Okay, uh, that's my, my basic claim in, in life that uh, people uh, understand data protection law in a way that it's not really th the full thing that we, we can think of, and it's really worthwhile to think about this in, in a more complex way. So, data protection law is not, of course, as about protecting some data from some s somebody. It's, it's it's something different, and it's uh, not about. Um, keeping some data private. It's not even about private data at all. It, is, it applies to all personal data in the sense that it also applies to data that are public. So it's, it's a, something that is more related uh, to an interaction. And this is where the slides, now the difficult part, so you need slides to understand with a, with a great uh, conceptual thing. So data protection for me is a triangle in the sense that there are three actors that are there and they have an interaction with in many interactions between them. So who are these people that we we put in, in action through data protection law. Basically, it's the data controllers that we call, so the those who want to process data and, and decide what to do with, with data. Then we have the data subjects, that the law calls data subjects, and that's the people to whom uh, the data are, are related. So the individuals, if, if somebody collects data about you, that will be you. And then we have um, uh, data protection authorities. And these are the, the, the actors, and this idea that data protection law, privacy laws, 
is, is a sort of interaction, uh, a sort of dialogue, comes already from the 70s and even from the end of the 60s. And the idea was then really, you know, remember there was these big machines, the, the big computers that took a whole building to have a, a computer. And the idea was that people can, indeed, if they want to process data, process data, but on the condition that they establish a special relation with those to whom the data relate. They cannot just put the data somewhere. They have to inform the person about this fact. They have to give some rights to the person the person can actually check that the information is there. That was the, the basic idea in the, in, at the end of the 60s. And then in Europe, we, we imported this idea. And we said, well, that's very nice that you have somebody with a big machine and uh, taking the data from everybody and give an exchange of some rights. But that's not enough. We don't trust the system. So we put also some independent authority to double check that everything is being complied with. In this are the data protection authorities. In the United Kingdom, you have the information commissioner, so sort of uh, somebody checking in principle that everything is fine. So that's the, the, the basic idea in, in data protection law. And what I find more interesting, especially now that you are here as anthropologists, is the, the relation between data controllers and data subjects. So this relation, it's a complex relation. It has basically two movements because it's complex. I keep having very, very <laughs> complex graphics to, to explain this. <laughs> So that's part of this dialogue, and I think it's, it's important that this dialogue that it's enabled by data protection law is not a dialogue like, uh, can I take your data? Yes, no. That's the idea that some of you perhaps had in your mind when you close your eyes, but that's not what data protection is about. It's not about asking you yes or no, can I have your data, and that's it. It's much more complex, and, and, and indeed part of this discussion is uh, the data controller wanted to take some, wants to take some data from the data subject. But here, you actually don't need me to explain that this is not that you're extracting the data from somebody. Yes, we don't have the data that, uh, that fall from, from us. We don't extract data from people. <laughs> That's the message of critical data studies. Data are not a given, so we cannot just take data from, from, from people. We somehow construct this data indeed with the help of the individual, but also the, there's, a, there's a construction of, of this data. Everybody's familiar with this, more or less. So that, I think that this part has been more or less studied enough or is being studied enough, the way in which we, we, we kind of create this data and this, this collection, which is not a collection, but a, I don't know, a, a sort of, yes, an artificial collection of, of data. What I think it's less explored is the other part. So with data protection law, when you collect data from somebody, in exchange, you have to provide some information in exchange. You have to pr always provide uh, some information to the person about how the data was collected, which data was collected, and also about the rights that the individual has. And that's indeed the uh, terms and conditions, whatever privacy policies that nobody uh, likes and, 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 no, and nobody reads. And, and we can come back to, to this. But basically what I think is interesting here, so, so that there's some data that is given to the data controllers, and then some data, some information that is given to the data subjects and some data that is given back. And I think that these two parts deserve much more study, hopefully with, with, with many other people. But first, the information that is given back, which is this uh, sort of, actually the two, the two things that are given are transparency requirements. So I think this transparency has to be problematized in, in many ways, uh, but especially this data that it's given back, because if we agreed two minutes ago that no data can be given, data are not a given, Data are not also, also not something that is given back. And, and I don't know if any of you have had a, an experience of actually uh, using your data subject rights and, and exercising a request for your rights. So you, you can request a data controller to give your data they have about you. And the people who have done this, it's, it's normally a sort of very, very uh, troubling experience. It is uh, very, very difficult to understand. And it's very funny to hear them uh, explain this experience because they, they, they will really uh, question themselves, like, I received this data and that's not me, as, as if that was a sort of surprise. Uh, it's, it's very, very strange uh, how um, people relate to this data. And I think we are all quite naively is indeed expecting to have some data about us in a, in a sort of mirror way without really understanding that actually these data were constructed in a certain way, that what we are getting back is a construction of the construction, is a translation of the translation. And, and, and there are many things that we can learn through this translation, but it's not really about us. It's that what we're learning is about all this making of, of data. So I really think these are two aspects that, that, that we have that deserve being explored. <laughs> The part about the information, that's the part about the uh, transparency requirements, terms and, and conditions. Uh, I, I know, I think everybody as, as individuals, we're all concerned with this uh, information that we cannot read. And that's also something that, that deserves much more attention. 
I was at another interdisciplinary uh, uh, event and, and I, somebody was discussing the, about dark patterns. I think some of you might be uh, familiar with this idea of dark patterns in design. So that's the way you, you can uh, manipulate people in, in some way through design. I'm convinced there are also dark transparency patterns. So the way in which information is given to individuals can also manipulate individuals in, in some way. I have, uh, I think we spent almost half of the, the presentation and I did not mention yet the GDPR. Did I mention the GDPR? No. Well, I have to mention the GDPR. The GDPR, the, the General Data Protection Regulation, one of the points of this GDPR was actually to, to, to improve this transparency. So one of the messages is saying uh, controllers have to give some information, but it's not enough to give information. When we say give information, it means give information in a way that can be understood and it makes some sense for those who receive it. This is a sort of, oof, really, really, data controllers, really? I have to give information in a way that people understand? I, I don't know who are these people, I don't know what they want. It, and it's, it's very, very confusing and that's one of the practical ways in which anthropologists perhaps or somebody might one day help us to, to, to explain to people, to data controllers who really don't know who you are, they really don't know who you want, what you want, is how, what people need to, to, to understand. And then perhaps when we, uh, as data protection experts or, or the data protection authorities or the judges or somebody understands what people need to, to understand and want to understand, we can indeed go to data controllers and say, well, all these things that you're doing are a joke. I think uh, currently these transparency requirements that are imposed by the GDPR are not being complied with, but I think what is more worrying is that we, as experts, we, we, we apparently don't know but how to, this could be complied with. There was a, a judgment uh, two days ago or oh, three days ago, two days ago, I don't know, from uh, the court in Luxembourg, so the Court of Justice of the European Union, about these transparency requirements and, and, and the, the kind of discussions that these judges with very good intentions are having, for me, sometimes it is really, uh, there's a really gap, uh, important gap with, with reality. Like they would say it's very important uh, that in the cookie notices, you, you know the cookies, cookies? Yes, do you accept the cookies? Yes. Well, this cookie notices is a sort of, 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 of ultimate uh, challenge for, for the mind. Uh, how is this happening? What's the purpose of all this? And I think there are many good intentions. Indeed, the idea is that you have to give information, but the judge will tell you, well, it's very important that actually these data controllers give information, for instance, about the, the, the duration of the cookies. So you have to know that when you visit the website, if a cookie is being, uh, if you consent or not to a cookie being, being uh, place in your computer. It's very necessary that you know for how long will this cookie because it is not the same thing to, to accept a cookie for one week than for one year. And I understand that that's uh, very reasonable in abstract, but in practice, uh, come on, uh, can you really expect people in general every time they go to a different website to make this sort of calculations and, and what's the, 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 in the end the other value of this sort of calculations? I think we are missing something at some point, we are missing something and we will really need more, more input on what people uh, understand, what people want. And I'm saying this, uh, being a data protection expert, and, and uh, this morning I actually took a selfie of myself with a stranger for, for a cupcake. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so, so what do people do and, and what, what? So there, there, are, there are many questions that uh, are unexplored, but we have, we have to think this. So we need more research on data subjects, on individuals, on data makers, on, and, and, and this uh, compliance with uh, transparency. But I think we, we also indeed need more research uh, on, on, on the data that we are re receiving. And what's very interesting for me is that actually this uh, data subject of rights, so this possibility that we have with the law to actually access data about us in a strange way is also useful uh, beyond our uh, uh, legal uh, friends, is useful for, for everybody. So I don't know if you have been following this, but it's a sort of now trend precisely because of the GDPR to actually, for people to exercise these, these rights, to try to understand how they are governed, how they are part of these uh, data flows that are, are around there. This is just uh, a French uh, journalist and she was using Tinder and she really wanted to understand how Tinder was recommending uh, some uh, types of, of, of profiles to her. She wanted to understand this better and at some point, uh, so I think this book is translated or is being translated into English, it's really worth uh, while being read. She really wanted to understand it like in page 200 or something, she says, well, apparently one of the possibilities is that I actually try to, to uh, request access to my data, so the data that Tinder has about me, and, and she has a lot of trouble uh, getting this data, but then she, she finds uh, somebody, an expert that can help her and, and, and they get eventually some data. So there are limitations to this right, but it's very, very still useful. And one of the 
little tools that we do have to try to, to understand indeed what is happening there, which kind of data people have, and what are the limitations. Uh, I am not sure I, I will really convince you today that this is uh, completely useful for you, but uh, uh, this managed to, to convince other people. We, uh, as a research group, we managed to convince other people. This is a collaboration we had in, in June uh, last year, or this year in June, uh, with the uh, Center for Interdisciplinary Methodologies in Warwick. They are basically sociologists or interdisciplinary sociologists, and we, we, we really th came to the conclusion that it's useful if you're studying the digital, whatever it is, it is a useful thing to study this digital with uh, data protection rights as, uh, uh, to study at least what could be the, 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 the uses and the limitations of this. So uh, I think I still have a couple of minutes or something. I, I wanted to tell you this is like the theory and, and I hope uh, maybe you, you can read this or try to if you're interested in this and, and to give you one uh, little example through the, the, the question of uh, gender. And I've been thinking recently <coughs> about the, the way which um, Gender is somehow governed through, through, through the yes, data uh, processing uh, online. Uh, you have heard already today quite a lot of things about, about gender, about women's rights. And I think that's very important, but it's something that I'm, I'm missing on, on, uh, in the discussions is that normally, indeed, they come uh, like uh, when we are talking about the algorithms and we are talking about the, 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 the impact of uh, AI, but we are not talking about what happens before. So the algorithms are very funny, that's true, and this is something, this is the, the screen of my, my own laptop uh, in, yes, uh, a few weeks ago I wanted to give a lecture on gender and law in general, this is the title of my lecture, I don't know if you're familiar with this, this is when you're, you're very lazy or you're very late and you want to prepare a, a PowerPoint, and then uh, you have the automated suggestions from, from uh, the PowerPoint, saying, well, with th for this title, this is the great picture that you should use. And I wanted to do a, 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 a talk on gender, technology, and law, a mapping, and what is the suggested picture? <laughs> yes, it's disabled people, so I don't know. I don't know, that's the algorithm telling me that if I want to talk about gender and law, well, I probably I want to, to talk about diversity. That's, is this the message that the algorithm is telling me? I don't know, but so the algorithm is telling me something about gender. And I think what we should really try to understand, in addition to this, what, um, is uh, how, the, yes, what the, how the internet structures us in, in terms of gender. So I think some of you have a Twitter account, yes? Do you know which gender do you have for Twitter? No, well, uh, I also didn't know, I'm, uh, but actually it's something that you can figure out because if you have a Twitter account, uh, for instance, Twitter is giving you uh, a, data, uh, a gender. So you might have actually told Twitter what's your gender and that's a sort of data thing that I give. But if you didn't, nevertheless, uh, Twitter will tell you that you have a, like infer your gender from your activities. This is the, the, I'm, I'm the you have the, the Twitter account of, of my own research group. And then uh, actually, so the Twitter tells you on the basis of your activity, we thought you might be female, male, or, 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 or no, male or, or female. And then if you disagree, you can actually disagree. And you can actually also uh, add your own gender. Like uh, in case perhaps somebody at Twitter thinks, well, maybe you wanted to tell us your gender in another way and that's your pro problem. But that's not really my point. Which I think it's an important point, but I think what is really a mystery to me and, and that I really like, I think we should all try to understand at some point, or somebody should have understand, is how does Twitter actually uh, make these assumptions, infer that I'm this or that gender. I have to say I'm very um, interested in this because through all my life, my gender has been misgendered. So uh, since I was three years old, apparently I do something wrong and people think I am a man when I'm not. And, and, and so this happens to me very often. So I think it's very curious that it not only happens offline, but also online. So what do you do wrong? Of course, but do you do wrong? But, but uh, why, in which cases, uh, the internet will think that, that you are this specific gender on which basis? So basically they tell you, oh, it's on the basis of your activity and behavior. And then you can try to access somehow data about the Twitter things, your behavior, your activity is. And that's, again, uh, very, very troubling when you actually ask Twitter, what do, what do you think? It's my interest, I, I try to explore the possibilities they have. They think I'm interested in Viktor Orban. I'm really not interested at all in Viktor Orban. I might be interested in democracy and how Viktor Orban is a threat to democracy. But uh, so on the basis of some data, there are some uh, alg inferences that are there and, and how do we access this data? How we all uh, 
understand how these data are being made and what can we do about this. I think uh, data protection law has really something that uh, that is useful for us here. And actually, that, that's that's almost the, the end of uh, my uh, talk. And, and just I wanted to uh, come back to this idea of me uh, making friends with people who believe in ethics, because I've been uh, trying to think about the relation between law, uh, data protection, gender, and, and, and in, gen in, in, in different ways. And uh, I, I'm often confronted with this idea that it's an ethics thing. No? It's, uh, so I, there was somebody very famous who said, women's uh, rights are human rights. Yes, we agree. And then, uh, so that's a sort of statement. Then uh, we have I know quite a lot of people who say digital, digital rights are human rights. I can agree, digital rights are human rights. And there is some sort of crazy syllogism where actually when you say uh, women digital rights are human rights, no, they are data ethics. <laughs> and, and, and I'm confused and I think that's wrong and I think uh, there are many, many serious problems and this morning we heard about, about Twitter being a toxic place and, and there are many things that cannot be solved through ethics that we require us to think about, about gen gender-based discrimination but also about the, the attribution of gender online and many things that perhaps we, we can somehow discuss and there's a Q&A uh, later so perhaps see you there. Okay, thank you very much.